the first discussion we had today about payment for performance is what is payment for performance? At the end of the day, all payment should be for performance, otherwise you know, oxymoron, payment that doesn't lead to better performance. And we felt that uh, a lot of the schemes seem to be limited to add-ons, to a small percentages paying fees for certain areas that you want to incentivize, such as in one case maybe improvements in increasing preventive interventions, in another area improving quality for a particular procedure. I think the point that we were getting at today was that the whole payment is for performance and we need to design these basic payment systems in the case of hospitals uh, based on DRGs. How we use the DRG and link DRGs with a number of quality incentives, guidelines, regulation. The conclusion has been interesting. To some extent we've been saying there's more than payment for performance. Payment for performance is an element. It's economic incentives which are important but if you rely exclusively on these economic incentives, then you may uh, have some unwanted results. Uh, you may want to see, you will be see gaming, you may see increases in volume of interventions that you don't want, and so on and so forth. So we saw payment for performance as an improving of payment systems. We talked a lot about having information appropriate, do not get into a very detailed incentives unless you have the information about the practice of those providers, unless you have good evidence-based medicine, so you know that these interventions are actually cost-effective and you're prepared to pay for them. And we realize that sometimes it's not just the amounts, but that the, the new culture, the signaling, saying, listen, we have data. Even in some instances, we've been talking about paying for performance, by having better information systems, which is not the outcome, but is an important intermediate process to get better outcomes. So by paying for that, we signal, we change the culture of, of the providers. We see examples, for instance, in France. Uh, they have this system in primary care called CAPI, which accounts 10%, I think, of the overall income, uh, that uh, has had a higher impact that you would expect considering the amount of economic incentive because of the changing culture, because of the ways it moves. And a second important element, complementary if you wish, is that you should be cautious because you may break the trust. And where professional standards are high, where professional practice is high, and they are doing already certain procedures and you begin to pay for them, it's like if you're assuming somehow it's not part of their professional profile and products. So you have to be very cautious when you decide to pay for particular procedures because you may end up actually breaking that kind of trust, breaking that kind of good practice by linking things that ought to do as a GP or as a consultant by linking them to incentives. That's some of the areas that we've been talking about over, over the day today. For pain hospitals, most countries, if not all of them, have moved to some form of case mix measure, i.e. DRG, although they are called differently and there are different approaches. So we're talking about how, again, how do use those DRGs and add some quality incentives. Or we can perhaps adjust prices for DRGs in line of the priorities of the system or linking those DRGs with uh, cost-effective in, uh, information, in the case of the gate coming from NICE, the Germany from EQUIC. So the question is, payment for performance is paying by DRGs, is how do we add additional incentives on those DRGs? And again, not just economic incentives, but other kinds of incentives. Uh, uh, introducing, for instance, guidelines. So we ask those hospitals to, to use those guidelines. Or in some instances, using paying particular procedures within those DRGs that we know they are appropriate procedures. Of course, we always face the challenge that may be appropriate procedures but may be applied to the wrong <laughs> patient, to an appropriate uh, uh, provision. So it's this thing about doing the right things, the things right, and the right things as well. We need to distinguish these, these both elements. So at the hospital level, I think uh, the DRG will be the way to go adding all these elements we're talking about. There's an interesting debate as well about saying, well, should we use carrots or penalties? Should we actually, uh, or sticks rather, 
should we actually uh, assume that we want the providers to provide us the best care possible and when they don't do so, we reward them appropriately, we actually detract and we give penalties or, or stakes for that. Where it becomes really complex, where the DRGs are not uh, resolving the issues, is when we're talking about across levels of care. One of the lessons, going back to the DRGs very briefly, is that DRGs need to be keep modifying continuously, adapting to the new needs, adapting to the new evidence, and so on. And however, as I said, the real challenge is how you'd go across levels of care, because the DRGs serve as a very well-defined product in a hospital level. They're not as good when you have to talk about episodes of care or patients, chronic care patients particularly now as well, that you don't have pure chronic care patients. You have patients with multimorbidity. There's no such a thing as a diabetic alone. It's a diabetic, perhaps with pulmonary obstruction, perhaps with a coronary problem, and so on and so forth. So there is where a lot of innovation needs to take place as paying for performance. And their payment for performance, i.e. relying only on economic incentives, will not work. So we need to find ways in which we get practitioners and institutions across different levels working together and incentivize indeed some outcomes for the treatment of these chronic diseases, but many more elements such as guidelines, as I said, perhaps capitation adjusted systems, forms of supervision, and so on and so forth, will have to go together with the actual payment. So payment for, 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 for performance will not suffice as the mechanism to get integrated care. And in that sense, this is perhaps what we've been calling, or I like to call, the paradigm of the 21st century, which is the aligning. So the key issue is that a lot of the debate of payment for performance is on primary care, is on intermediate care, ambulatory care, is for physicians, for nurses, it's a hospital care. But the question is, how do you align all these incentives? And for integrated care, this is the key issue. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of our debate today has actually has been careful about only relying on payment for performance and economic incentives to improve the outcomes of the health system across, across primary care, hospital care, but particularly integrated care where it's particularly complex.